will you stand up and, I mean, not Jonathan, my goodness, Dustin, will you stand up and introduce your family real quickly, and then we'll, uh, we'll dismiss Junior Church. We are, we're the Duke family here from South Carolina. This is my wife, Emily, and then my oldest daughter is Riley, and my youngest daughter here, her name is Ainsley. All right. All right. Good to have you guys here today. We're going to go ahead and dismiss Kids Church at this time. You can go with the Kids Church, and so let's get them on out of here, and hopefully we'll get our focus on distractions here. Just a second. Will you please open your Bible to Revelation chapter 11 here this morning? Revelation chapter 11, and then also we're going to be in Zechariah chapter 2. So if you I uh, have a hard time finding it in the, in, first of all, there are Bibles available in every one of the rows. There should be some right under the chair racks near you. And uh, there's one for everyone. And if you have trouble finding finding passage of Scripture that's re, that's that we reference here this morning, uh, there will be plenty of people sitting around you that either help you. If you just look at them frantically and just like, oh, I don't know what to do. Like, ah. Or look at the, there's also a table of contents in your Bible that should have the page number which corresponds. So we're going to be uh, primarily in Revelation chapter 11 and Zechariah 2 today. And we're really uh, preaching a message today, which is part two of last week's message. We're in the midst of the three woes and the judgments in Revelation. So we're going to introduce that here in a moment. And but first of all, I want to read our text. I want to ask the Lord's help uh, this morning with just our focus, our ability to understand the Scripture, and also uh, for the application of it so we know how to live what we learn. Now, here we are in Revelation chapter 11, and I just want to read down uh, from verse 1 uh, down to verse 7, and uh, then we'll pray. There was given me a reed like unto a rod, and the angel stood, saying, Rise, and measure the temple of God and the altar, and then that worship therein. But the court which is without the temple, leave out, and measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles and the holy city shall they tread underfoot forty and two months. And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and threescore days, clothed in sackcloth. Verse 4, These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. And if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devoureth their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. These have power to shut heaven, that it rain not in the days of their prophecy, and have power over waters to turn them to blood, and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. And when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them, and shall overcome them, and kill them. Now we'll pray. Father, please help us today as we look at these weighty matters in the Scripture, and as we see literally how seriously the matter of the message of the gospel is. Not only today, but in the future. And as we see, these things help us to be reminded that the time is near when these things will come to pass. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to do a couple of things this morning. If you haven't been with us in our series in Revelation, it really is a difficult one from a preacher's perspective because it's so important to preach the book from start to finish. And there is so much that we have covered by way of ground just to get to this point. Uh, let me just encourage you, if you have missed some of the messages or you haven't been in the messages, uh, that on our YouTube page, LauderdaleBaptist.org, uh, we would have all of the messages. And eventually they'll all be uploaded together, but they're usually a week or a week and a half delayed as far as getting up. And it would be really important for you uh, to... Just, just catch those, and I, I recommend for you making a playlist if you have difficulty with that. Charlie could help you with that. Tony, I don't know where Tony is this morning, but he could help you with that as well. And they could give you a little bit of information on how to really get an overview of Revelation. Now, the question we asked in the first message was, why study Revelation? Why study Revelation? Well, the fact of the matter is that probably there's nothing more popular <coughs> excuse me, with regard to teaching or preaching in the Bible in general than prophecy. Isn't it so? Uh, if you were to go on a generic uh, Christian TV station, that is just just uh, look, um, look up online or on television, a television station, and you were to just weigh what is 
most often preached by people that are trying to kind of, if you will, please the crowds or preach what people want to hear. And most of what is <coughs> preached or referenced in uh, online or on television preaching is prophecy. Isn't it true? Uh, if you go on TV, and I don't really, I don't, uh, I'm not sure, I think I have a television tuner, but our, I don't know where our television is right now in our house. I think it's under one of the beds, one of the bedrooms or somewhere like that. But if you were to go on, on TV and watch TBN, you'd see the same people that I saw when I was a kid uh, still preaching the same messages or still reading headlines uh, of the newspaper, reading current events primarily that pertain to Israel, the Middle East, and Russia, and so forth, and then looking at how uh, that the current headlines are a fulfillment of Bible prophecy. I could name names and preachers and so forth. If you don't know them, it wouldn't mean anything to you. And if you know them already, then you already know. So it wouldn't be any point in mentioning individuals. But that is a large part of, of popular preaching. It's popular to study prophecy. But that's not why we're preaching the book of Revelation at Fort Lauderdale Baptist Church. In the first chapter of Revelation, if you could just turn over there, uh, we would see the promise that's in Revelation. And the promise, uh, if, you, if you just look down to... Um, Oh, where are we at here? Verse 3 of Revelation. There's a promise. Blessed is he that readeth. And they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein for the time is at hand. So our purpose statement here is in verse 3 of chapter 1, isn't it? The purpose statement is that we want God's blessing. I don't know about you, but I like a sure thing. I like a guaranteed thing. And when I find something that is sure or guaranteed in the Scripture, I think, you know what? I want to claim that. I, I know p individuals who are name and claim everything. And sometimes I've seen the church claim promises that are for Abraham or for Isaac or for Jacob or for David or even for Daniel. And they say, well, this is for me. Well, that isn't necessarily for you. There's maybe a principle about God in the promise, but not every promise to Israel is to the church. But this one certainly is. As a matter of fact, this one is more than just to the church in general. I want to be a church, don't you, that's blessed by God. And that has the blessing of that's promised in Revelation 1. But it's, but it's more specific than that. It's an individual. Blessed is he that readeth. And so if you read this book and you understand it and you keep the things <clears throat> that are written in this prophecy, you read, you hear, and you keep the things, the Bible says there's a blessing for you. And so most of the time in, in, in uh, the 12 years that I've been pastor at Fort Lauderdale Baptist Church, most of the time I preach Revelation on Sunday evenings, more of a Bible study format, but my thought process this year is that there's a blessing for our church, and uh, some of y'all uh, don't come on Sunday evenings. Now you ought to, but that's another discussion. Some of y'all don't come, and I want you to have the blessing. I want you not to miss out on something that God promises for you. And so our goal is for you to know what the future is. Now, there's some things that we need to know as well about Revelation. Revelation is not mystery. We're going to see mystery today. We're going to see the, the concealment of truths. Re Revelation is the uh, revealing of truths rather than the concealing of truths. And so if you go right back to... Well, let's go ahead and look at uh, one more thing that... Uh, that brings us into our context here today. Verse 19 is the outline for Revelation. You're going to study it. You need to study it, understanding uh, what we're dealing with with regard to material. In verse 19 of Revelation, John, who has had this experience on the Lord's Day where he literally sees the Lord Jesus, is told, Write the things which thou hast seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. Now, acknowledging that God is a grammarian, that is, every language that is used to communicate with has been given by God. Isn't that so? Uh, acknowledging that every word of God is, uh, that the words of the Lord are pure words, according to Psalm 12. As silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. So acknowledging that God's word is perfectly written. I, I, it, it's tragic that some people believe that God gave His word perfectly, but then they... Uh, don't believe that God preserved His Word perfectly. I've read this in doctrinal statements in church, and I think it's perhaps inadvertently written this way. Sometimes I think people just copy and paste, 
and they don't always think about what they're saying. But I've heard uh, doctrinal statements in church that say something about the Word of God like this. They say, we believe that the Word of God, they use the word inspiration, that the Word of God is given by inspiration, and that it is inspired and preserved, and they'll say something to the effect of in the original uh, copies. Which implies that because there are no complete original copies, that is, we don't have the actual letter that Paul penned or Peter penned or that Moses penned, that the Scripture was given perfectly, but it has been lost in its perfect form, and so we don't have the perfect Word of God. Now, that's problematic for a couple of reasons. First of all, it's problematic because it underestimates God. If God can create the world... And if God can give His Word perfectly, it's not a problem for God to preserve His Word. And the, the notion that God gave His Word and we cannot have it uh, contradicts everything that we understand realizing that God supernaturally gave His Word. Isn't that true? And so God's Word is preserved, is perfectly preserved. And I do reject. I reject any philosophy uh, or any translation of the Scripture personally uh, that does not reflect preservation. I believe God not only gave His Word, but He gave it so we can have it. He's not playing silly games like, well, you had it, but it's lost. Too bad. No, we have it, and it's intended for us to understand. Now, <clears throat> acknowledging that God's a grammarian, Revelation 1.19, we see three tenses. We know tenses in language, don't we? Write the things which were. Tell me what tense that is, will you please? Past tense. Everybody know past tense. It happened before. And then write the things which are present tense, and the things which shall be hereafter, future tense. My friend, simply understanding that God gave His Word perfectly, and that God on purpose wrote the tenses of the outline of Revelation, will help you to avoid all kinds of bad theology in this book. See, Paul or John writes initially about the experience that he had on the Lord's Day, and that's past. Then John writes about the present, and that is the church age. He writes the letters to the churches. And after chapter 3, you never see the churches again. The churches are gone. They're, they're, they, the churches, it, at that point, God begins working through Israel. And we saw that a couple of weeks ago. And now that's a future event. Now, it's also important today because, friend, I just want to tell you, there's some really, really rotten theology that's going on in, uh, unfortunately, Baptist circles. And it's, it's Catholic theology, actually, is what it goes back to. And uh, the theology today teaches that the believers are going to be part of this ter time period in which God Himself, with, heavens, with the heavens open, is literally judging the wicked. And the theology says that the church will be part of this. Now, this is known as the tribulation period. And this word tribulation period is one that is scorned or scoffed at by those same individuals. They would say that the tribulation is for the church. And they would use the example of tribulation in context of believers who are persecuted for the sake of Christ. But that same argument ignores the very, very valid, simple understanding that there's a big difference between somebody, some person persecuting or, or uh, uh, causing you tribulation and God. How many of you all think that no matter what a man does to you, your soul will be okay. No matter what a man does to you, God can take care of you. How many believe that? How many of you have a recourse if God goes after you? There's a big difference, isn't there? Tribulation at the hand of God or tribulation at the hand of man. We're told not to fear what man can do to us. But friend, we are to fear what God can do to us. And the notion that the church is in this period where we're seeing the seven seals and the seven trumpets and uh, the three woes and these judgments in the Scripture, the notion that believers, the church, are participants in God's judgment in this way, my friend, it's, it's just so fallacious. And it, it all is solved when you understand, first of all, the... <laughs> Outline of Revelation, right? The things which were, the things which are, the things which shall be hereafter. That's chronological, isn't it? Past, present, future. Now, we have covered the past. We've covered the present in Revelation. And now we are in the future portion of the book. And here we are in Revelation uh, chapter 10. Before this, we began seeing seven seals uh, that are written in a book in Revelation chapter 5. 
that book is referred to in Daniel. You could study, and, and we've, we've looked at it several weeks ago, and Dan, you could study Daniel chapter 12, and you could see that God revealed these future events to Daniel, but He was told to seal them up. The time wasn't ready to reveal them. And now we've seen that this scroll, uh, a codex form of a book, would not have been referred to in the first century. And so when we talk about a book, we're not talking, this, uh, this is codex where uh, pages are cut off on the ends and you turn from page to page and they're bound or sewn together in, on whatever the different type of material is. That's the kind of book we think about. But when we talk about book in Revelation, we're talking about a scroll. And there was a book that John sees and it has seven seals on it, and only the person who it is right or who it is written for has the right to open the, the seven seals. And who is that that's worthy? Well, it's the Lamb that was slain, Jesus Christ. He's the one who's worthy to open the book. And so John reveals the things that are in the book. Now, I think that's marvelous, don't you? Uh, all this time, from the time that Daniel sealed these things up, literally for hundreds of years... People have been saying, what did Daniel see? What was written there? And in the Revelation, we see what those things are. There's seven seals and their judgments. The first of the four seals of the judgments are things that happen to the earth. But one of the things that we see, first of all, is that now at this point, the heavens are rolled back like a scroll. And God on His throne is sitting there, and literally the whole earth can see Him. And at this point, when we come to the juncture where we're at, we've seen a third part of the earth destroyed. We've seen a third part of the seas. We've seen a third part of the rivers destroyed. And literally, uh, the earth is in great havoc at this time. Last week, though, we saw the beginning of the woe judgments. And these woe judgments... Okay, I'm getting ahead of myself even now. So the seals are... We really, in the seals, we see the introduction of Israel. We see the introduction of the end time events moving from the church. Then after the seals, we saw seven trumpets. The seventh, the seventh seal open, was opened, and there were seven trumpets. And those seven trumpets, judgments, were seven angels that each had trumpets, and when the trumpet sounded, the, the consequence or the, the judgment at God's hand would happen. And last week, we saw literally uh, the Satan unleashed. We saw the river Euphrates opened up, and, and the devils that were bound into the river were allowed to go out and torment men. Uh, we saw uh, we 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 saw uh, different angels released that that locusts, which were judgments on men, or able to torment men. We saw that in spite of all this, men desired to die but could not die, and so now things have gotten terrible on earth. And so look back in chapter nine and verse twenty, if you will, with me, please. And I want to see the conclusion that we saw last week after these uh, after these. Uh, trumpet judgments, and the last of which are the uh, are the woes in the first woe. Verse nine, verse twenty. And the rest of the men which were not killed by these plagues, yet repented not of the works of their hands, that they should not worship devils and idols of gold and silver and brass and stone and of wood, which neither can see nor hear nor walk. And then verse twenty one. Neither repented they of their murders nor of their sorceries nor of their fornication nor of their thefts. By the way, if you're outlining Revelation, this portion goes up to chapter 16 and verse 17. The, the three woes, if you're outlining uh, up until that point of the tribulation period, uh, this, this portion that we're in goes all the way of the events that happen. Uh, the, part of the parts of the third woe began at verse uh, 14 of chapter 11 and go all the way to chapter 16 and verse 17. And I apologize, I have so much material to give you and so many things that we've covered in the past that I cannot review. What we see in Revelation chapter 9 is that in spite of the terrible things that have happened, in spite of the terrible judgment on men, the fact that they can't die, that they don't repent. And really our conclusion last week is just an expose of what rebellion actually is. Isn't it incredible the audacity of rebellion? You know, we think a lot of times, don't we, when someone won't believe in God, that they have a good reason for not believing. Matter of fact, don't we, when we share with someone who we've shared the gospel with and they haven't believed, don't we usually give the reason why somebody doesn't believe? We do, don't we? Uh, you know, I spoke to this person 
and I was able to share the gospel with them. I could tell that the Holy Spirit was burdening, burdening them. But what they told me was, well, they had a bad experience in the past with somebody who was religious. Um, yeah, anybody here met somebody that wouldn't believe because of bad experience with religion? Sure, I've met many. Uh, you know, they, they had something in their life that they felt like before they became a believer in Jesus, that thing would have to be taken care of, and so they didn't believe because of that. Uh, you know, they just, I, I, I shared the gospel with this person, and they told me they just have a really hard time believing that there's a God. Well, they, uh, they, I, I shared the gospel with a person, and they told me that they had a really, really hard time believing that salvation could only be through faith in Jesus. Or I shared the gospel with a person, and they told me uh, that they really, really struggled with, um, you know, just sifting through all the religions and figuring out which one was actually the truth. There are a lot of reasons that people give not to believe, aren't there? I've heard them. I've heard people say, well, what about the people that have never heard? Well, there isn't any such thing, actually. And the Bible actually answers all those questions. The truth of the matter is, the root to every single reason why a person will not believe in Jesus is rebellion. Because believing in Jesus means bowing. You say, Pastor, no, I, I honestly think that the reason... No, I'm telling you. Uh, I've had people say, well, I don't know if there's a God. That's a lie. That's a lie. Everybody knows there's a God. Now, there are individuals who are angry at God, who have reason not to, uh, in their minds, to, to rebel against God or not worship God, and so they have developed an argument against God. You know, you can do that in debate class, can't you? They have debate classes where you're given a position, and you are supposed to defend or uh, articulate a position and argue a position. It has nothing to do with whether or not it's true. It's a position you've been given. And people make a choice of unbelief. And then they support their unbelief with whatever argument that they determine uh, best suits their narrative. Well, something terrible was done to me. Well, you know what? That's true. It has nothing to do with whether or not you ought to believe in Jesus. My friend, I want to tell you, there's no good reason when we answer to God for any person to say, I rejected Jesus Christ. There'll be no good answer. The only answer is ultimately, I would not bow. I would not receive Jesus Christ. And this portion of Revelation just exposes this for me in such a helpful way. Years ago, I saw this, and I'd ask the question, how could people see God on the throne in heaven and see that these judgments are at the hand of God? By the way, this is why we reject as believers the notion that the wars and rumors of wars, which Jesus said, are not a sign of His coming in Matthew 24. This is why we reject the notion uh, that these events are allegorical. I can remember back in the 1980s, I mean, Saddam Hussein, larger than life, Babylon, uh, Babylonian Nebuchadnezzar figure, and uh, he and uh, the Pope were going to be working together to become the Antichrist. I mean, all the books. I, I, you know, Saddam Hussein's been off the scene for a few years now. It doesn't look like he's going to be the guy. But uh, it's incredible. You know, and, and I remember you know, watching different uh, presentations of tanks and Apache helicopters. And, you know, I remember when Apache helicopters were the locust plague. No, my friend, the locusts are animated, literally, angelic demons that are coming out of the ground. They've been, in, they've been in bondage. They've been locked up. And God has been reserving them for this form of judgment. These scorpions, uh, they, these, these, these locusts which have a tail to sting uh, like scorpions, these, these animals which are so fearful, they're not Apache helicopters. It's not an unhinged president of some country unleashing his military. It's literally God judging. And yet we see in conclusion people are saying, no, God, I won't believe. Uh, matter of fact, to support that, let's, let's jump ahead. We'll, we'll get there in a couple weeks. Let's go ahead and look to chapter 16 and verse 21. I want to, want to see this. Uh, this is really the end of right after the end of the second woe, and this is when God is going to come and, and, and the vile judgments begin. In verse 21, the Bible says, There fell upon men a great hail out of heaven, every stone about the weight of a talent. We think that's between 75 and 100 pounds. So these hailstones about 75 to 100 pounds. And the Bible says, And men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, for the plague thereof was exceeding great. There needs to be a certain point in time when a person says, you know, enough's enough. You'd think, wouldn't there? 
Wouldn't there be a certain time when an individual would say, okay, God's serious about this judgment thing. God takes my sin seriously. God takes my rebellion seriously. You know what? Maybe I'll quit rebelling. And I, for one, cannot relate to a rebel to that degree. Can you? See, I have many times had believers ask me, how can a person see God in heaven and see the hand of God in judgment and still be rebellious in their heart and not believe? And I've had people try to draw the wrong conclusion that you cannot be saved during the tribulation. And it's false. It isn't so. The 144,000 uh, from Israel that become evangelists to reach the multitudes get saved in the tribulation period. But people that believe along those, those lines think, well, God, you know, this is just a time when it's too late and God is just holding people in unbelief and just torturing them for His own delight. No, that's nonsense. It isn't what's happening at all. Even in this period, God is using uh, His kingdom with Israel for people to come and to be saved through Jesus Christ by faith, the same as it always has been, and yet people don't believe. And they, they, the question is why? Why? Well, if you're a believer, you cannot, you cannot understand the answer to that question, to be quite honest with you, because only a rebel can understand rebellion to that degree. Some years ago, I understood, you know what, I don't understand why a person would do something self-destructive. You ever wonder why a, uh, a young man is raised in an abusive home and he has a father who uh, who just is, is hard on him or abusive toward him and, and uh, then he grows up and he becomes like his father. You ever wonder why? And it doesn't always happen, does it? A lot of times a person says, you know, I'm never going to be like my dad. And they find grace and God helps them to have victory and they change, but sometimes they grow up the same. Um, you ever wonder why uh, uh, a, a little girl will be raised in a home and... Um, She'll see behaviors in her parents that are just absolutely self-destructive. And then when she grows up, she does the exact same things. She, maybe she has a father who abuses her mother physically and uh, is abusive toward her. And so to teach her dad a lesson, she goes out and gets a boyfriend that treats her worse than her dad does. I've seen it happen. And you ask the question, why? Why? And the answer is, well, rebellion. Why would someone destroy themselves? Why would they, they allow themselves to be destroyed or undergo judgment? You say, Pastor, it's just twisted, sick thinking. No, the twisted, sick thinking is rebellion. Is what it ultimately comes down to. You know, there's grace for every person. There's grace for every individual in every circumstance. And you have a choice. See, some people take their circumstances, and instead of looking to a good God who hates the evil, they call the good God evil, and they call the evil good. And that's rebellion to make that choice. And friend, rebellion is what it is, and here it is exposed. There is no person that can say, I don't really believe there's a God. No, God is right there, and you can see Him. The, the, literally, the heavens are rolled away. And a rebellion here is exposed for exactly what it is. Well, I want to look at just this uh, command that John has given to, first of all, uh, first of all, I want to look at something that's sealed. In verse, verse 1 of chapter 10, he says, I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven, clothed with a cloud and a rainbow was upon his head and his face was as it were the sun and his feet as pillars of fire and he had in his hand a little book open and he set his right foot upon the sea and his left foot on the earth well this is pretty descriptive isn't it this mighty angel the part of this uh, second woe judgment the bible says he cried with a loud voice as when a lion roared and when he had cried, seven thunders uttered their voices. So when he cried, there were seven thunders, and each of them said something. What did they say? And when the seven thunders had uttered their voices, I was about to write, and I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered, and write them not. And the answer is, it's, it's too much for us to hear the answer to it. This is the midst of the second woe judgment. Literally after the earth has been destroyed in this great way, this last angel says, whoa, 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 because of the next three trumpet judgments. Literally, literally, this one is so terrible, it is beyond our description. Friend, I want to warn you, the future for an unbeliever is terrible. The future for a rebel is terrible. It doesn't get better. It isn't as though I survive and then the outcome is good. No, it's terrible. And in, in verse 5, the angel which I saw stand upon the sea and upon the earth lifted up his hand to heaven and swear by him that liveth forever and ever, who created heaven and the things that are therein are, and the earth and the things that therein are, and the sea and the things which are therein, that there should be time no longer. 
But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished, as he hath declared to his servants the prophets. Are you in Zechariah? Well, let's go to Zechariah uh, real quickly, and I want to read a passage of Scripture which corresponds uh, with where we're at here today in our text. Uh, Zechariah chapter 2, and while you're looking at Zechariah chapter 2, I want to look at verse 2 of chapter 11. But the court which is without the temple, leave out and measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles, and the holy city shall they tread underfoot forty and two months. And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and threescore days, clothed in, in sackcloth. Okay, chapter 2. Uh, I lifted up my eyes and looked, and behold, a man with a measuring line in his hand. You see the parallel between verse 1 of eleven of Revelation 11? There was given to me a reed like unto a rod. And the angel stood and said, Rise and measure the temple of God and the altar unto them, and then that worship therein. And then verse 2. Then said I, Whither goest thou? And he saith unto me, To measure Jerusalem, and to see what is the breadth thereof, and the length thereof. And behold, the angel that talked with me went forth, and another angel went out to meet him, and said unto him, Run, speak to this young man, saying, Jerusalem shall be inhabited as towns without walls for the multitude of men and cattle uh, within. For I, saith the Lord, will be unto her a wall of fire round about, and will be the glory in the midst of her. Now let's pause here just for a second. This, is, of course, is a prophet after the captivity. And the question is, has this ever happened in Jerusalem? No. There are individuals that try to say that everything that God was going to do for Israel is finished. And all the promises uh, that are unfulfilled for Israel are through the church. And the church is going to be part of the tribulation. And these events that God's going to do are going to be with the church who is spiritual Israel. No, my friend, this is Jerusalem. And this is national Israel. We established this two weeks ago. We looked very, very carefully at the question of is the tribulation, is this time in the tribulation, is God working through Israel or through the church? Well, it's 12,000 of the 12 tribes of Israel, each mentioned by name. And friend, you just cannot allegorize it. It's, it's just way, way too much work to fit it into your system of belief if you want to go that direction. It's actually Israel. It's actually Jerusalem. And in verse 8, Thus saith the Lord God, Lord of hosts, after the glory hath he spent me into the nation, sent me into the nations which spoiled you. For he that toucheth you toucheth the apple of his eye. And I'll pause here again and rebuke anyone who will take an anti Semitic position. Amen. There are individuals today that are railing against those that are Jews according to the flesh who are not believers. Now, probably in this room here today, it's normal for us in every service to have individuals that nationally are Jewish. It's normal for us in most of our. Uh, in our church in Miami Beach and here as well, to have individuals that are nationally Jewish, but you're a believer in Jesus Christ, so you're a Christian. You're a follower of Jesus. We understand the difference between an unbelieving Jew and a believing Jew, don't we? We do understand the Bible says that they say they're Jews and they're not, and it's speaking specifically of their unbelief. But make no mistake, national Israel, genetic national Israel, is still national Israel. And when the Bible says that a person that touches you touches the apple of my eye, you ever been poked in the eye? <laughs> First of all, it hurts, doesn't it? It's an affront, isn't it? Is God here speaking of believing Israel that are the apple of his eye? No, the unbelieving Israel. There are individuals that today that say God hates Israel. And the, the anti-Semitism that they're spewing out of their mouths is, first of all, ignorant. Secondly, it's hateful. And friend, it's dangerous. It's dangerous. You had better look out if you're a believer... You may say, well, Pastor, I don't know about what's going on in Israel today, the Zionism there and so forth. I don't believe that God is at work in Israel today. My friend, I don't need to argue with you about that. I would simply say God is at the work of preserving a nation today because He has a future for them. That is not to say God is blessing Israel today. My friend, God's blessing is very specific, very on purpose, and it's not ambiguous or mysterious. Is, is the... Is national Israel, which is established today, is that the Israel specifically? Uh, is that the nation God's going to reestablish? Well, the answer to that question is you don't know and neither do I, actually, honestly. But God is preserving the nation, and they are a part of that preserved nation, no question about it. And the location there is the location where God's going to be working. That's Zion. It's the place. So, is, is uh, what happened in 1948, 1967, was that supernatural? Well, certainly God 
God stopped the eradication of a people. Literally, in every era, in every age, individuals have tried to wipe out national Israel. Today they're trying to. And there are individuals who are supposed to be born again, blood-bought believers, that buy into the nonsense of it. And even will say that the Jews today aren't actually Jewish. And all kinds of just conspiratorial nonsense. Nut, they're just nut jobs. That's the only way that I can phrase it or put it. Do you know that the Israel that walked out of Egypt with a mighty hand, that their carcasses dropped off in the wilderness and they died because of unbelief? Did that make them any less of the nation that God had promised Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that He would do something with? Did everybody that was, that was rescued out of Egypt, did they go to heaven? Are they in heaven today? Has God ever universally saved a nation? Has salvation ever just been a national thing? The answer to that question is salvation has always been by faith in Jesus Christ. Always has been in every era, in every age. And so it's nonsensical today to say that because a, a, a people, a nation, a national group do not believe that God cannot save their, their ancestors. We could have a show of hands today and ask the question, how, do, how many of you came from a believing home? And most of us would have to say we're one or two generations away uh, from our families just being completely pagan. That's actually the truth of my family. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, I'm really, really bothered by abortion. It, it's, it's evil, it's wicked, it's just, it's just terrible. And every time I think about it, it just makes me sick to my stomach. Mm. And it, 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 it becomes very, very personal to me because I realize how wicked our family was. My, my family, the family that I'm born in. This isn't related so much to the message today, but let me just share a little bit with you about that here today. Um, my dad's great aunt burned our family tree. She burned it, and it's too bad because we lost a lot of family history. But the reason she burned it is because my dad's great-grandfather had a wife and five kids in Pennsylvania, and he left his wife and five kids and moved to Salina, Kansas, and started another family. And so our family wasn't particularly proud of their heritage. Uh, understandably so, isn't it? I mean, now we know people in Pennsylvania related to our family. It's just kind of like, yeah, you're, the, you're that, that group of, of people in your family. That's kind of bad. My dad's grandmother had a mother uh, that birthed his, my dad's grandmother out of wedlock. And that was back in a time period when that didn't happen. And the reason that she had a baby was because uh, she'd, been, she'd been raped. It's really a terrible thing. And uh, I'm really glad that she didn't have an abortion. Our entire family doesn't exist because of that. And there's just so many people that believe so much nonsense, so many terrible things. You know, that's all secret. My, dad, my grandfather's brother didn't even know about that until about five years ago. Never even heard about that. Never even knew about our family history because everybody covers things up and hides things. But the, the reason I say all that is to say, you know what, I come from a pretty terrible bunch of people, actually. I mean, just, just the, the, the heritage, the history of my family is pretty horrible. But I'm born again. My dad's saved. Matter of fact, most of our family are saved today. Even though we come from people, uh, from uh, our, even though our heritage are a people that are just wicked. Really just the worst of society in their day. We're saved. And the notion that because, of, because parents don't believe, children won't believe. My friend, is so illogical. It's actually so ridiculous. Aren't you glad your children can turn out better than you? And why is that? Because of a gracious, good God. And here we have a time period when God is going to be working through national Israel. And we have... the. It, I almost said the word idiot. And my wife isn't in here, but it's still not a nice word, so I'm not going to say it. We have individuals today that think they're theologians that purport this nonsense that Israel according to the flesh today, God has no future plan for, and they're just a farce and a, and a fraud. And, and I, friend, I'm sorry, but it just doesn't fly with the Scripture, and it doesn't fly with common sense. And we need to have some common sense. And by the way, we ought to confront the nonsense. We're losing people. We're, we're having people fragmenting out of our churches over this nonsense. 
There are a couple people right now uh, that irregularly attend our church that are getting caught up in this foolishness. And it's tragic. And it's one of the reasons why when I'm preaching, I say, I wish I didn't have to deal with this because it's so ridiculous, but it ought to be dealt with, shouldn't it? And so here we see, uh, here we see now this in, in Zechariah chapter 2, this future event, which is in Jerusalem, and in, in uh, Revelation is to measure the court of the Gentiles. Now go to chapter 4 of Zechariah, will you please? Zechariah chapter 4, verse 1, The angel that talked with me came again. This is, of course, Zechariah giving, giving his account. As a man that is waking out of his sleep, and said unto me, What seest thou? And I said, I have looked, and behold, a candlestick, all of gold, with a bowl upon the top of it, and his seven lamps thereon, and seven pipes to the seven lamps, which are upon which are the top thereof. And then verse 3 is where we want to come to. And two olive trees by it, one on the right side of the bowl, and the other on the left side thereof. And and in verse 4, Zechariah asks what these things are. I hope you're taking notes here. Go down to verse 11 in Zechariah 4. The reason you ought to take notes, just get these references and study them as a parallel. Uh, and it's pretty easy to remember. Zechariah 4 and uh, Revelation chapters uh, 10 and 11. Specifically chapter 11 here. Verse 11 of Zechariah 4. Then answered I and said unto him, What are these two olive trees upon the right side of the candlestick and upon the left side thereof? And I answered again and said unto him, what be these two olive branches which through the two golden pipes empty the golden oil out of themselves? And he answered me and said, Knowest thou not what these be? And I said, No, my Lord. Then said he, These are the two anointed ones that stand by the Lord of the whole earth. And you see, you say, Pastor, oh, you're taking me on a long journey. I know you have to read all of Zechariah. You have to read all of Daniel. You have to read all of Ezekiel. You have to compare Scripture with Scripture. And I just cannot do that. Uh, I can't read all that with you. But if you go back to Revelation chapter 11, I want to read these two verses again. In verse 4. Revelation 11, verse 4. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. Do you see it? And what are the two olive trees? Well, these are these two individuals. If any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth, and... and uh, devoureth their enemies, and if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. You could also jot down, if you're taking notes, not just Zechariah 3, but chapter 4 and chapter 14. Deal with this. And this is... Uh, uh, let me go back to chapter 3. Or, or I mean to verse 3 of chapter 11. I will give power to my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and threescore days clothed in sackcloth. Now, if you were to divide uh, a thousand two score and, or a thousand two hundred and threescore that comes down to uh, 360 divided by three and a half. That's the three and a half years, the midpoint of the tribulation that's referenced here. What midpoint of the tribulation? Well, again, I wish I could review everything. You'd have to go back and look at a message we've already preached. But in Daniel chapter 9, in the 70 weeks of Daniel, there are only 69 weeks that are fulfilled when the Messiah is cut off, but not for himself, but for the sins of the people. A week is a term that's used in the Scripture, just like we would use terms that would give us numbers like, for instance, dozen. How many is a dozen? Twelve. Twelve. Uh, how many is, is a couple? Two. Two. We have terms, don't we, when we uh, want to throw out a generic number uh, that represent, and a week is seven. A week is seven. Now, we use it mostly when we're talking about a period of days, and we talk about a week. But in the Scripture, in Daniel's prophecy, we're given to understand very, very plainly that a week uh, are, is a period of years. And 70 times 7, 490 years. There are seven years left that have to be fulfilled before the restoration of Jerusalem, restoration of the temple, before the reign of Christ. This is the midpoint. Three and a half is half of seven. You get that? Now, uh, we understand, I hope we understand the difference between the Jewish calendar and the Roman calendar and the 360 versus 365 days. There uh, is an average that comes out in a year's time over a period of time when uh, just because the way God made the universe in an orderly way. A year is a year regardless, right? Can we agree that a year is four seasons regardless of which calendar you use? Uh, you don't have two winters in a year. Matter of fact, you don't have many of them in South Florida. But uh, in places where you have winters, you don't have two winters or two summers. We do have two summers. <laughs> we have winter. What, what do we have? We have winter, summer, fall, uh, uh, sorry, winter, spring, uh, summer, and fall. Those are the four seasons, right? And every year uh, we have 12 different moon cycles that make up the 12 different months. 
And so I don't need to get into instructing you about calendars, but we understand that this is the midpoint of the tribulation. 1,260 days is the midpoint of the tribulation period. And things are about to get real. Now, these two individuals that are witnesses that God uses, of course, are evangelists. These are individuals that are, that are uh, declaring the truth about the kingdom of God through Israel at this time and about the judgment of God. And just like in this day, just like today when the gospel is preached, it is opposed. In the day of these witnesses, it's opposed. But God's not playing games here. Today, you want to reject the gospel. This is the age of grace and God's long-suffering. He's merciful. And by the way, many of us rejected the gospel before we received it. Many of us at least paused on it before we received it. Isn't it so? Yes. But, and so, so we recognize that many individuals that maybe would not instantly turn to God and with hearts of belief, uh, maybe instead would try to withstand against His judgment. Uh, maybe, maybe there's a future where they, where they do turn. But this is not, this, in, the, in this, this tribulation period, these two witnesses, which uh, we think are Moses and Elijah, uh, or it could be maybe, you know, John the Baptist was Elijah that was come. But we think that probably at least one of them was Elijah, maybe another one. Uh, there was, there's a lot of speculation about it. I think it's Moses and Elijah, but that's just what I think. Uh, I, I'm not going to be adamant about that. And that's, a, that's honestly, it's, it's worthwhile to study, but it's not worthwhile to be adamant about because they're two witnesses, two individuals. And they're, going to, they're individuals that probably haven't died. Could have been Enoch, could be the other one because he hasn't died physically yet. But, um, the fact is that these two witnesses preach the gospel. And I like verse 5. If any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devoureth their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. <laughs> I'm glad that I don't have to preach the gospel this way, aren't you? I mean, the truth of the matter is, is that sometimes it's in my flesh to wish ill on somebody who's mean to me or cruel or unkind. These are individuals that are preaching. They're, they're witnesses for God. They're preaching the kingdom of Christ. They're preaching the kingdom of Israel. And those individuals that don't like them and try to hurt them, they just don't take it from them. You want to hurt me? Fire comes out of their mouth and the person that opposes them is killed. Now we're laughing about it, but it's really, really uh, apocalyptic, isn't it? I mean, it really is literally one of those things that if I actually saw it, uh, I would probably be going like this, you know, uh, I would feel like a sibling is getting paddled here, uh, it, but but to to a great degree. I don't know if you grew up in a spanking home, but uh, nobody was glad when anyone got spanked in our house because it was terrible. You know, when somebody got spanked, it was such a terrible thing that you know you didn't wish it on anyone. And I can imagine being a bystander here and seeing these individuals being opposed and someone literally trying to hurt them or trying to kill them, and they're saying, "Can't hurt us or kill us. You just you just cross the line." People just get burnt to a crisp. Dead. God's not playing here. He's not playing games. And you know, that's as far as we're going to get today because that's our conclusion today. Our conclusion today, my friend, is this. Individuals, according to Peter, 2 Peter chapter 3, that asked the question about God and why God is so passive in dealing with the wicked, asked the question, where is the pro promise of His coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were until now. In other words, God started the earth and He wound the clock, you know, the clock winder theory, and everything is just going on. God's not involved. God doesn't care. God isn't doing anything. God isn't judging anyone. And so He's not going to judge. But the Bible says this they willingly are ignorant of. It talks about they're willingly ignorant of the, of the flood. And then the second thing they're ignorant of is that there's going to be a fiery judgment that destroys the world. And these are the events we're beginning to see in, in, in Revelation. But Peter's conclusion was this, the Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Hear me now today, would you please, Christian? Listen, God's not slack. God's hand is not slack. God's judgment is not maybe, it's not possibly. God's judgment is sure. But He's a merciful God. And hear me today, God loves you very much. You know, there's no innocent person. You might say, well, I never did anything and I had such a terrible life and I don't know why God did all these things to me. God never did anything to you. Hear me today, God never did anything evil to you. God hates any evil which was done to you and God will judge it. 
But God has tolerated your rebellion. God has tolerated your unbelief because He doesn't want to destroy you. You ever just been in the position where someone you felt like needed mercy even though they didn't request it? Even though they didn't... I mean, I'll tell you, there's, there are people that I've just thought, you know what, you deserve. But if I can, I'd like to be merciful to you. God is so much more that than any of us are. And God's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And you and I must realize that this is in the innate character of God, but that anyone who does not receive God will ultimately face judgment. And friend, it's terrible just the judgment that He meets out through His witnesses. How much more is it a fearful thing to fall in the hands of an angry God? You and I ought to be in the right way. We ought to be afraid of God. We ought to be afraid to stand before God in judgment. Man, when I read events like this, you know, I, I don't doubt my salvation. I don't question my salvation at all. I know, I know that, that salvation is by faith in Jesus Christ. He that believeth is not condemned. He that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed. And I'm a believer. And I know that. And I've, I've, I've am familiar enough with the Scripture that I know that my salvation is not dependent on my works. It's dependent on faith in Jesus Christ. And by turning to Jesus, I know for sure that I have eternal life. But it still scares me. It makes me go, oh, I better be saved. I better receive the cross. Listen, my friend, God's attitude towards you is that while you are yet sinners, Christ died for you. Have you received Him? Have you received Jesus as your Savior? Then how about compassion? I loved our Sunday school class today. Brother uh, Dustin concluded with talking about reaching the lost. And one of the things that he just talked about was just loving the lost. Just the conclusion was that we have to love the lost. You just have to be compassionate to love the lost. You ever see somebody and you know they're in a lot of trouble? And you know, sometimes I see somebody's in a lot of trouble and I think, boy, you, you're going to get what you deserve. Nicholas Cruz is in the newspaper again this week because he voted. He registered to vote. I'm scared to death for that kid. I don't care, care whether he voted or not. I don't care who he voted for. It doesn't matter a bit to me. To be quite frank with me, with you. He's in trouble. He's in a lot of trouble. You know, my first thought after, after he massacred those innocent people, my first thought toward Nicholas Cruz was, boy, that's terrible what he did. But you know when he said, you know, they need to just kill me? I thought, oh, you better hope they don't. Mm -hmm. Oh, you're in trouble. You're in a lot of trouble. I hate what he did. I'll be honest with you. I, I wouldn't defend him for anything. And, and I can certainly understand people hating him. But he's in trouble. I just, I just think, man, I hope somebody can get to him. I tried. I tried to, to reach out. There's just too many barriers to try to meet with him or share the gospel with him. But I just think, man, if he doesn't get born again, you know where he's going to go. You know where his eternity is. You know there are blasphemers. It, it, it amazes me. You knock on a door and you just try to talk to somebody. And people say, before they even know what you're talking about, they say, not interested. I'm not interested. And I always want to say, what are you not interested in? You know, what? What aren't you interested in? You know, you, you haven't even answered the question. You, you don't even, you're not even open enough to the most important message in the world to even know what you're not interested in. And I just think of those poor folks that are not interested. And I just think that someday, if they never get interested, they're going to burn. Friend, that's terrible. And ought to move us. ought to move us to compassion. To implore people. You ought to love one that, says, that, that makes fun of you or mocks you for your faith or whatever and they don't want to hear it. My friend, you ought to just see them. Realizing that God's not slack. But he's long suffering, but his long suffering is going to come to an end. And the world's going to be destroyed with fire. And these individuals are going to be part of it unless they turn. I'm so glad that God's merciful in every era and every age, but friend, the day is going to run out when God's merciful. We live in the free for all for mercy. I mean, God just wants people to receive Jesus. And He's just offered a whosoever will salvation. And it's just a free-for-all. I mean, anyone that'll, that will come can be saved. 
we're so distracted sometimes by personalities or by the responses that we engender. And we really ought to just say, you know what? God's heart toward them is one of long suffering and mercy, and it'll be mine as well. You hear this morning, you don't know Jesus as your Savior. Friend, you don't have forever. You don't even know how much time you have. In our text, here we see that time comes to an end. No more time. Folks are in trouble at this point. There's three and a half more years, and after that, that's it. It's going to be the great battle of Armageddon. God's going to destroy all His enemies. Jesus Christ is going to speak, and they're going to be just destroyed by the word of His mouth. Is that what God wants to do? Is that God's desire toward the wicked? No, He wants them to come to Him in repentance. How about you? How about you? What's your attitude toward God? Father, I pray that You would help us to just see ourselves. As we look at the rebellion of individuals and even at the reception, as these two individuals that are given the power to not only preach, but to defend themselves by fire coming out of their mouths, we see ultimately the world rejoicing when they are wounded and they receive a wound that appears to be a death wound. God, as we see these future circumstances, we're reminded that revelation is not a study for us that doesn't have any purpose, that we're supposed to keep the things that are written in this book of prophecy. And God, the practical application of what we see that we need to keep here today is we need to keep reminding people of the gospel. We need to keep preaching the gospel. And Lord, we need to keep uh, compassion in our hearts. And God, we need to keep ourselves. Lord, if there is rebellion found in any person that's here today, we recognize that the end for the rebel is destruction. There's no survival. It's just destruction. God, I pray that you break hearts of rebellion. If there be a person here today that does not know Jesus as their Savior, God, I ask that you would give them the fear they ought to have of your judgment. And then God, help them to know your mercy that you judged your son in the place that they, that they deserved. And that, God, the salvation is freely offered. And God, for believers, those of us who live as though, as though the future doesn't matter or as though there are no consequences for not living for you or not telling people about Jesus, help us to see how real these events are and how terrible they are. And Lord, help us to warn the lost. God, I pray that as a result of the message being practically applied in our lives this week, that we would warn people and that this week people would come to know Jesus as their Savior. We ask it in His name. Amen. Amen. Before we dismiss our service today, uh, let me offer to you an invitation. We're not going to have a come forward invitation in our service here today, but uh, we do have one every single week. We never do close uh, the invitation. Uh, if, if the message today has given you more questions than answers, and it's quite possible that it has, we have answers. We don't know everything, but the Bible has an answer to every question you have. But if it's brought about a, a particular question in your mind, which is, I don't know. I don't know if I'm saved. I don't know if I'm going to be part of the church that's taken up when these events happen. If that's you, uh, you can know that you're saved. And we can help you with that. There's several people that are here today that could help you. Uh, Brother Charlie's right here in front of me, and he'd love to share with you how you can know you're on your way to heaven. Uh, Brother Dustin Duke, our evangelist, is with us here today. I'm here. Uh, Brother Andrew, a number of us, you could just ask and say, you know what? I'm not sure I have eternal life. And we could help you to, to leave today knowing with full confidence and assurance that you have eternal life. It might be that you're here today and uh, you just have a problem and God's convicted you about something. Maybe it's the way you're living. Maybe you're living as though the future doesn't matter. Or you're living as though people don't matter. And the fact is, is that we're called to preach the gospel. You'd say, you know, I'm not preaching the gospel. Or I'm not living my life in light of how real it's going to be when heavens roll back like a scroll and God is judging a wicked world. Well, friend, we can help you with that as well. All it takes, you are just one second away from confessing the things that God calls sin in your life and uh, surrendering the things that God wants you to and being right back in fellowship with Him and living today and tomorrow differently than you lived yesterday or last week. God's a merciful God, and He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And it's a wonderful thing that He's that way. I, you're dismissed today if you're visiting with us. Again, let me uh, just thank you for coming.
and we're delighted to have you. And we hope that you'll come back. We're finishing up our series in 2 Timothy uh, this evening, and so I hope that you can make it. Uh, you're dismissed.